Good morning. Merry Christmas. I'm happy to invite you this morning to, as the Christmas Carol invites us, come and worship, come and worship, come and worship Christ, our Savior King. Let's come and worship him in prayer as we begin our time together this morning. Lord Jesus, we have had the privilege and joy of acknowledging your birth over these days. And we reflect with so much thanks that you came from heaven to us. What a gift you made yourself to us, Lord, and call us to give ourselves, our lives back to you. Oh, Lord, would you meet with us this morning as we turn to your word? Would you encourage us? Would you speak to our hearts as we give you the glory today? In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us on our Facebook worship page today. Uh, always glad to be able to serve you in bringing the word of the Lord and hopefully a message of encouragement. I know that it encourages people to see who is there. And so I do invite you to just log in, say that you're here. Uh, it encourages me to see who is able to watch. And I know those who are watching uh, like to see who is able to join them. I am going to dispense with much of any announcement this morning and uh, just get right into the scriptures. The first passage that we are going to read is from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. The time is coming when there will be no more gloom for her who is in distress. In the former time, God brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. They represent the northern areas of what we now call Israel. In the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then turning to the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, beginning with verse 8. Jesus has been born. Jesus is lying in the manger. And now in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. 
Praise the Lord for his word and his good gifts. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a privilege it is to come and worship you, the same one that the shepherds came to see, the same one that Mary and Joseph held and marveled at in the manger, the same one that the wise men came to bow down to and, and to bring their gifts, the same one who grew up as a righteous man, the same one who entered ministry and, and was followed by disciples and many, the same one who yielded your life to death on a cross, the same one who was raised on the third day and has ascended into heaven and is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God, the same one who is praying for us right now, interceding on our behalf, the same one who sent your Holy Spirit to fill us with your life and your joy, the same one who one day will return to us just as you went up into the heavens. You will come back for us and bring us to be with you forever. Oh, Lord, what a privilege it is to glorify you and to worship you. Would you deepen our awe, deepen our wonder, empower our service, Open our mouths that we might tell others of the joy that you have brought to us in our lives, that we might invite others to follow you even just as we have. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, even as we think of rejoicing and as we do rejoice in these days surrounding Christmas, our hearts turn to people for whom rejoicing is very difficult. The COVID matters that continue to grow and the cases that continue to mount and the people that we know and love who are suffering and, and some who have passed away and some who have lost loved ones. Lord, there is a heaviness of heart. The peoples whose economic well-being is greatly diminished and are struggling, the people who have needed the ministries of the food kitchen, the soup kitchen, and, and other things, and the people for, all, for whom all of this is such a burden and, and a darkness in their lives. Oh, Father, I believe that you care about them. I believe that you know them and that you love them and that you care about them. And one of the reasons that you have left us here is that we might be emissaries of that love in word and in generosity, in service, in love. And so even now, as, as we lift up to you the people, the needs that concern us the most, we want to offer ourselves as your servants to be able to intercede, intervene, and help meet those needs. So hear us now in these moments of quiet as we worship you, as we seek you, as we pray, interceding for others. Hear us, O oh Lord, we ask. Thank you this morning for all of the gifts of your goodness. We thank you for sharing your life with us. We thank you that you use us to bless others. Oh, please do so, even this week. Thank you, Lord Jesus, would you speak to our hearts. In your most holy and precious and loving name, we pray. Amen. We'll turn back in your scriptures to the first passage that we read, Isaiah chapter 9. That is going to be the focus of our time together this morning. Most years, we don't really need Christmas, at least not as we do it. We, it's a nice celebration. It uh, pulls people together, uh, hopefully most of the time. But I, I would offer to you that most years we don't really need Christmas, even though many things about it we want. 
I know some people who actually really don't like Christmas at all, whether it's a, a Christmas that's full of crass materialism and, and way too busy with superficial and shallow things, or whether it's because of a loss in a family, or whether you're having the expectations of the annual family fight around the Christmas table, or, uh, or, or Uncle Joe who shows up and, and causes the trouble that Uncle Joe always causes or the expectations and hopes that you have that are just not met again, or the loneliness that you feel while you watch other people getting together. There are people who not only do not need Christmas, they really don't want Christmas if what we typically do is what Christmas is about. Christmas is dark, at least for some. It's, all, it's not all light and cheer. It's dark at Christmas, especially this year. And it's like the setting of Isaiah chapter 9, as before Isaiah chapter 9, he uses the words distress, darkness, the gloom of anguish, a thick darkness. That's, a, that's just a really heavy, burdensome, thick, thick darkness. And that's the context that the message of the announcement of Christmas comes into. Uh, it's a dark world, and Christmas dawns in a message and a season of darkness. Glenn Scrivener, who wrote the poem that I shared on the song playlist today, uh, he wrote a poem called Christmas in Dark Places. If you haven't yet viewed it, I, I hope that you will. He speaks, I think, very accurately and clearly uh, to us about the nature of this season. Glenn grew up in Australia, and which is obviously the Southern Hemisphere. And so while we are, we are experiencing the darkest days of the year, they're experiencing the lightest days and the longest days of the year, the warmest days of the year, where you can bask at the beach and go swimming in the ocean and you have your barbecues and all of your delicious fruit and everything is summer and light and bright. It was quite a challenge to him when, as a teenager, he moved from Australia, halfway around the world, uh, to England, where it's dark at Christmas. It's very dark at Christmas, even dark to those of us in New England because of how much farther England is north than we are and how much earlier it gets darker. And so his experience of Christmas in England could not have been more different from his experience in the Southern Hemisphere. But as he came to live here for a while and he reflected on the story of Christmas, when you read the Christmas narrative and you read the scriptures that announce Christmas coming, it's not the light and beauty of summer. It's not warmth and joy and fruitfulness. It's darkness. It's despair. It's barrenness. And so even forgetting the idea of snow and all of the cultural things that you and I associate with Christmas, Christmas and its message is much more suited to the darkness of winter than it is an expression of the brightness of summer. And especially this year, because the darkness is not just the darkness of night and more hours without the sun, there, there is much dark around us. Most years, we don't really need Christmas. But I've been feeling this year, especially as the pressure and the stress and the darkness have increased, the, the theme of Advent and the theme of Christmas and the hope that the Lord would bring to us is exactly what we need. And in fact, perhaps the darkness of the world would help us to tune our eyes to look to a different light and a different solution to our problems um, than we typically look to. Oh, yeah, there are little glimmers of lights around us. There, there are the vaccines that are now available. There are the economic stimulus bills. There are help, hopeful signs in terms of jobs and things. But truthfully, all those things are just temporary fixes. Um, a new virus will come that will not be able to have a vaccine or the economy tanks again or your own personal circumstances take a nosedive. Um, all of those things are great right now, but they're not dependable. They're not something that you and I can rest on. And that speaks nothing of the tone of the culture that we live in, which is very discouraging and, and very depressing as we live amid this particular tone. To, to best 
experience and express the joy of Christmas, you have to hold it up to the darker background. I liken it to the beautiful Christmas star that has been visible a few nights uh, leading up to today. The first evening that I saw it, it was late. It was about 5.30 and the sky was black. It was, it was dark black. And uh, I didn't see a lot of stars yet, but you could see the Christmas star off to the southwest and it was a beautiful jewel. The next night I saw it, it was about an hour earlier. The sky was a, a light grayish blue. And if you looked very, very carefully, you could see this little pinprick of light in that very same place. And that was the star, but it wasn't really visible too well. You couldn't, you couldn't see it. It didn't make a big difference. It was only against the dark background of the sky that the light of the Christmas star shone beautifully and brilliantly. It is really against the darkness of culture, the darkness of life, the darkness of our struggle, that the light that Christmas brings to us has the opportunity to shine so bright and be an encouragement and to lead us, and to lead us into the truth. The darkness that begins Isaiah 9, the gloom for those who were in anguish, verse 1, the contempt that some of the land felt. Those words that I read from the prior verse about darkness and distress, the gloom of anguish and the thick darkness, that darkness was very real. It was, it was darkness that's represented by ignorance of God, not knowing who he is, not even necessarily believing that he is actually there. There's a benign darkness of having never really heard, but then there's a more significant darkness of just rejecting, of turning away from the light about God that we know. And that's certainly where we live today around us, where people have turned away from the light and the truth and the goodness of the God whom we know. It's, it's a rejection of the truth about God. And rejecting the truth about God leads to rejecting the ways of God, which means we don't treat each other the way God would have us treat each other. We treat each other in a self-serving way, the way that will best meet our needs. And if that means harming you or doing something to you, well, sure. Sin, evil, darkness, the love of harm. You know, we have created a world in which the darkness envelops us. And it was the same kind of darkness that enveloped the people in Isaiah's day. It came from the top down and it worked from the bottom up. From, from the top down, as we spoke a number of weeks ago, King Ahaz was a wicked king. He hated God. He hated the things of God. He didn't even want any gifts from God when God had offered it to him. And his model trickled down to the people. A, a, a king who hates God is certainly not going to lead his people in a godly way. When your rulers are full of darkness, woe to you. When your rulers are full of righteousness, then there, there is hope. There is hope for goodness. So whether it's a king or, or an emperor or a president or a czar or a, a prime minister or whatever kind of leader, when there's darkness at the top, it spills down upon everyone else. Well, for the people here, it wasn't just darkness at the top. It was darkness through and through. The priests and the prophets, they didn't follow the Lord. They rejected the Lord. They, the, the priests were into empty religion, and the prophets were only telling people what they wanted to hear. Today, I look to those as to governor, government leaders, economic leaders, educational leaders, religious leaders, social leaders, and, and so much of that in our culture has no interest in God at all, has no interest in the truth. In fact, is, is passing more and more laws to ban even talking about God in public places, to worship Christ. And I'm not suggesting that we try to go back to some kind of a mythical Christian nation, but a nation that at least respects the reality that God exists and actually his standards are good. Well, the, the leaders are not leading us in that way. They, they lead us just as much for self as the, the higher rulers. And then you get down to the people, the you and me of this age, full of wickedness and violence and self-absorption of, of hard hearts, of living blinded to the ways of God. And 
electing people who affirm those things. And so it comes not just from the top down, but it comes up from the bottom. On top of that, the people in Isaiah's day were facing enemy foes. They were facing Syria and a little country nation of Judah above them. And certainly there would have been others around, a big bully, Syria, not too far away. Um, you know, nowadays we have all sorts of opposition from outside. And as I speak to you this morning, there's all of the all of the turmoil regarding Russia and China and whether we have spies in our government and uh, government hacks, you know, we have, we have all sorts of enemies on the outside who would like to take advantage. And then the physical world itself is against us. <clears throat> who would have thought that this tiny, tiny chunk of RNA could turn the world upside down? Talk about grab the dog by the tail. This tiny, tiny little speck, smaller than a flea, bites the end of the dog's tail and the dog is just destroyed. You know, the physical world itself, we're fighting against it and thank the Lord for the things that he's given us. And so we think about the darkness, the, the darkness, the kind of darkness that Isaiah was identifying, the, the COVID deaths, the economy and jobs. It was dark. But thankfully, darkness isn't the only thing. It, humanly speaking, we, in this darkness, there have been so many little points of light, as the first President Bush liked to talk about, the thousand points of light. There have been beautiful points of light, of encouragement. The fire engine parades that have gone around Wyndham, and I am sure all over the country, seeking to, to bring joy and some celebration to people. Just the, the decorations. I have seen more decorations this fall, this Christmas season, than I've seen in a long, long time. By the time we went to get our Christmas tree, a couple of the places that we went to had hardly anything left worth picking, and it's never been like that. People are in a mood to celebrate and to decorate and to seek beauty. The, the work of our soup kitchen and, and the meal ministry here in, Mil in Willimantic and the people who continue to give and give and give to be able to serve the people who just don't have and are struggling and suffering. Uh, the food distributions, the government programs that have brought baskets and boxes and boxes of food. The toy drives, which this year are, are bringing in more than ever. The, the 900 cars, the chain that went through one of the drive throughs and it lasted 900 cars before somebody broke it. Of one car, the people paying for the person behind them. 900, I think it took three days. And it, the, a point of light. The beautiful display of love of the people. I forget what state it was in now, but the, they, the, I think it was in Virginia. They, they loved their UPS driver. And for how he had served them faithfully through this entire pandemic season. And they lined the street and with the cars and were honking their horns and had banners. And it reduced him to tears of joy because of the light that they showed to him. All of the growth online, the, the virtual mass choirs, the way people have developed strategies for coping, the way restaurants have developed strategies for serving, the, the amazing creativity, all of these things. So, so many of those things would not have happened if it were not for the darkness of this season of COVID tide. And, and that's a beautiful experience. But in, in truth, those things, while they're great, don't actually serve the ultimate problem that we have. Because the ultimate problem is not just the external things. The ultimate problem is it's what's going on in our very heart itself. Because the darkness doesn't come on us from outside. So much of it is the expression for the king and the leaders and the government people and us normal humans. It comes from our pride. It comes from what the Bible calls sin. It comes from our unwillingness and our, our lack of desire to be what God wants us to be because we'd rather be what we want. And the fruit and the result of that is darkness. And the Bible lets us know that sometimes the Lord allows that darkness to produce even more darkness. And those are the situations that Isaiah was writing about here 
in Isaiah chapter 9. But the beauty and the grace of God's character is such that he still has a promise. He does not give up. We read a little bit from verse 1. Let me come to verse 2 of Isaiah 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. If you were with us a few weeks ago when I spoke about this, this is written in the Hebrew in a future kind of a tense. And that future tense is said, it's called a prophetic perfect, and it speaks of something that will happen, but it speaks of it so confidently as if it has already happened. And so it's not just that they will see, that they have seen. God has a promise, and that promise is a promise of relief. The promise that the light will come and the darkness will end. He has a promise that there will be relief and that it will end. But not only that it will, there will be a relief, but in that relief, it will be a time of restoration. Verse 3, you have multiplied the nation where the nation had been experiencing great division and great subtraction. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. They are glad as when they divide the spoil. The picture is of restoring, restoration and, and renewal. There is an estimate that our recovery from this COVID time will take years. Uh, who knows how long it will take to, if, if we get back to the kind of, of economic and social uh, conditions and prosperity and people doing well as we had before. Uh, thankfully, there's been some resilience, uh, better than we've expected over this year, but it will take a long time for a lot of these wounds to heal. The picture here is that God will multiply the nation. The people's joy will be increased as in the harvest when there's a banner harvest and you have so much that you have to split it to share it and to give it and to share it and to give it. Um, there's an abundance to just spread things around. The Lord promises a time of restoration. That restoration comes through a time of release from the burdens, a release from the oppression. Verse 4, the yoke that he bears, the staff that has been beating his shoulder, the rod that has been oppressing him, those things have been broken as on the day of Midian. Every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult, every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. Those, those forces of oppression, those forces of hardship, and everything that hurts and harms is vanquished. It is sent away. And the picture that the Lord uses here is a very telling one. For you and I today, it's much less familiar to us. But for the people of Isaiah's day, it would have been very, very fresh. It happened in the day of the judges. Uh, judges was a time where the people had a cycle where God had established them and they were thriving and then they turned away from God. God delivered them into the hands of enemies until the time that they repented and called back and he came again and the cycle repeated over and over again. Well, in, uh, in Judges chapter 7, the people had grown very, very wicked and they were not interested in following the Lord again. And so God appointed one of their neighbors, Midian, to oppress them. Seven years. You know, we're hoping to turn things around in a year. This was a seven-year oppression. And finally, I don't know why it took seven years, but after seven years, the people finally called out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up a man named Gideon. You know him from the Gideon and his fleece. That doesn't come into our story today. What comes into our story today is that using Gideon, a force of 300 people had victory over an army, over 120,000 people. Can you imagine the celebration from this tiny, tiny little force vanquishing this vast, vast army? Well, actually, God did it. And the people rejoiced because God had delivered his people. God had a great, great victory for his people. This is the image of rejoicing that God brings in what he's going to do in the future. The, the implements of war will be destroyed. It's sort of like the, the spears being turned into plowshares. The hostilities will be ended, and, and there will be a great victory. And so release from oppression it makes me think of, you know, on a smaller scale, a little Goli little David coming against the, the great Goliath. And God was with him and gave him 
of victory. God promises a time of relief, a time of restoration, a time of release, and it all is accomplished with a ruler. For God's promise of a ruler, verse 6 and verse 7. This ruler is very unique. It's described in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What that truly points to is one who is human, the child who is born, who is also divine, the son who is given. He comes down from God to us to come up as a child to lead the people. And he has authority to lead. The government will be on his shoulder. He has the authority to rule. He has the authority to make decisions and to lead. He is going to rule over his people. And as a ruler, he has a reputation. And there are four phrases, four names by which he is called that he embodies. He is wonderful counselor. That is who he should be called. In this day of false truth, in this day of who do you believe, in this day where I am just so tired of listening to all of this back and forth and back and forth, the Lord promises one individual who will be our wonderful counselor. His words will be full of the wisdom of God. He will speak with the authority of God. He will speak the truth. And as Jesus said in John 8, you hear my words and you listen to me, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We are in such bondage because of all of the conflicting messages that we get and the, the difficulty that we have discerning where is the truth. Well, with this leader, there will be truth. It will, be not, it will, not, will not be uncertain. He will speak with the wisdom of God and he will counsel us in the right way to go because Jesus' words to us are the truth. Well, he will not just be called Wonderful Counselor, he will be called Mighty God. If you know anything about the empires of the day, uh, whether it's Assyria or Babylon or the ones who are coming, Persia, Greece, Rome, one of the things that those leaders liked to be called was God. They liked to be viewed as a deity. And especially in the first century, the Caesars really applied that title to themselves. In fact, if you did not confess Caesar is Lord, which is a sense of his deity and his supreme ruler, they would kill you. Their idea, the mighty God. Well, the one who is going to come would truly be the mighty God. He would be God who has come to dwell among his people. He would come with the power of God. He would come with the might and the strength of God. And the character of this wonderful counselor, who is also a mighty God, is the eternal father. Not as in God the father, but the father of his people. And a father who will not die, a father whose presence will not end. He is wise. He is powerful. He has the heart of a loving father, the heart of a shepherd who will care for his people. Because that's really the picture of a father. Psalm 103 talks about the father who loves us and cares for us and sees our need and forgives our sin and has compassion. And his, his time as our father is not going to come to an end. We're not going to have one benevolent leader followed by a dictator, followed by another dictator, followed by a, maybe another benevolent leader. He is an eternal father. And he is the Prince of Peace, who inaugurates the final rule of God's peace. He brings us into a relationship of peace with God through dealing with our enmity, the, the hostility that God has toward our sin and separates us from him, and the hostility that we have toward a God that we don't realize loves us. And so he, he heals the brokenness in our relationship with God. He heals the brokenness in our own heart, in our relationship with ourself. He heals the brokenness in our relationship with friends, with people that we know, with our communities, with our world. And he ushers into the world an eternal peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is unlike any ruler that this world has ever had. He is unlike any ruler that this world ever will have until he comes back. Earthly kings will rise and fall. Earthly empires will advance 
and decline, but he will last forever and his reign will last forever and it will increase forever, this promised ruler. And it says at the end of verse seven, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In other words, God is 100% committed to making this happen. There is nothing that will distract him. There is nothing that will take it away. God is eagerly waiting to unleash his promise to us. Now, we usually stop at this verse, but that's a mistake because this passage is just one passage in the whole section from Isaiah 7 through the end of Isaiah 12. We could call it the book of Emmanuel, the book of how God is with us. You really have to read from Isaiah 9, 8 through the end of chapter 10 to get a picture because the next context, Israel, the northern kingdom is dealt with, Syria is dealt with, and unfortunately, Judah is also dealt with because despite all that God was doing for them, they never actually really returned to him with their whole heart. Judah was so dealt with that the kingdom of David was gone. In fact, when you finally come to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, the kingdom of David is referred to as a stump. What's a stump? A dead tree. The kingdom of David had been a beautiful blossoming tree. Well, the tree's down and it's been hundreds of years. The stump is dead. There hasn't been any life in that at all. But it is at a point where there is that stump. The kingdom of David is dead. It's not gone, but it's just dead. And in fact, the king who's there is Herod, and he is from Esau, not from Jacob. So he doesn't even belong there. He's ruling under Rome. There shall come forth, chapter 11, verse 1, from this dead kingdom of David, a shoot, a, a branch. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and of might, of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he goes on to talk about how he will be righteous and just. He will take care of those who are in need. He will strike evil with the rod of his mouth. Righteousness will be the belt of his waist. And he will break hostilities. The wolf and the lamb the leopard and the goat, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, the child and the den of the cobra. All of those things will be healed. All, all of those animosities and hostilities will be healed. And the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the ultimate restoration, the ultimate goal that the light that Christmas is, is pointing toward. It isn't just about even having a good holiday. It's not about that. It's about what God is ultimately going to do to end the circumstances that we find ourselves in and to replace them with his ultimate kingdom. God is a God of this promise. He made these promises 700 years before Christ and we get to read about their fulfillment. We already did in Luke chapter 2. And the passage that we began with in Luke chapter 2 begins in the darkness. Shepherds were out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And against the dark night, the glory of the Lord came and the angel of the Lord came. And he said, this shall be a sign for you. A baby is wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger because this child has been born in the city of David, a Savior, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The promise that lights our darkness came in a little baby who was Christ the Lord, our Savior, the one who rescues us and is all of those glorious names to us. The shepherds came after the angels chorus, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The shepherds came and they marveled at what they saw. And then they ran off to tell everybody that they could think of and everybody that they would meet about who they just saw. The light of God's promise was born at Bethlehem. And he is the one that brings the light to us because friends, the, the darkness is not over. We, we still live in a dark world. 
You know, there, there are people who have been very critical of President-elect Biden's words about the darkest days are yet to come and thinking that he's being a pessimist. Well, I think he's just speaking that we should get ready for no quick fixes, that, yeah, the vaccine is here, but that's not going to fix everything. And now there's a new strain of the virus and who knows how many others of those will happen. We, we ought not to become giddy over things that are taking place. We have no idea how many more Jenga tiles are going to be pulled out before some real stability comes and the whole tower crashes down. The darkness is over. But at Christmas, the light that we look to is not dependent upon any of these things. The light that we look to is not dependent upon our circumstances. In fact, it shines in spite of our circumstances, against our circumstances, to give us something to look forward to, to give us a person to look to, even in the middle of the darkness that seems to be unending. Jesus, in John 8, 12, said, I am the light of the world, of this dark world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it was God who said, let light shine out of darkness. And he has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The darkness around us isn't over. But friends, when you and I come and we trust Christ with our lives and our hearts, when we give our hearts and our lives to him and follow him, his light takes up residence in our heart and it shines from within us. And as it shines from within us, it has the opportunity to shine to the other people around us who don't know it yet. Who don't know it yet. One of the videos that I had shared a few weeks back is an excellent little animation about a, a father and a son walking into a toy store and there's a little snow globe there and the snow globe is there and what's inside it is just deathly and the father and the son are there looking at it and the son is looking and and there's a, a little button on it that says try me and, and and when he pushes the button all of a sudden he's inside the snow globe and it's not really a snow globe but it is a globe where the, where the people are and and the people are in a terrible place to be. The, the, the people are, are just like monstrous. And, and it's a picture of death and despair and sorrow. And he finds themselves right in the midst of them. And they're coming at him and they're grasping at him. And, and as one of them, as he touches one of them, all of a sudden there's light. And, and this is happening at the base of a, a tree with its branches in the shape of a cross. And he finds himself back outside with his father, and he's looking at it, and he looks up at his father, and he says, let me go. And then he pushes the second button that says, go. And he enters the globe, and he begins to bring light. That's the purpose of that. And the message is that God loved the world so much that he sent his only son for you and me, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. And that life lights a light in our hearts, even in these darkest of times. Friends, I still believe that most years we don't really need a Christmas the way we usually do Christmas. How many of us have more than enough stuff already? How any of us don't need the stress and all of the struggle? We don't need that Christmas. But this year, more than ever, we need the light that Jesus Christ brings to us, the light that is in his life lived for us, the light that is the lifting of our hope as we come to know him, as we trust him, and he, he, he gives to us release from the penalty of our sin, release from guilt, release for shame. He, he brings us into his family as his brothers and sisters. He gives us all the inheritance of heaven as an eternal inheritance for us. Because in this one, the son who was given, the child who was born, our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our everlasting father, our prince, of peace has come and he would change the darkness of our lives into light 
you know that hope today? Is Christmas just another celebration? Is Christmas just another holiday, another headache, another whatever, however you would however you would describe it? Have you come to surrender the, the throne of your life to him who made the manger his throne for a little while? To him who reigns on heaven's throne. Because there's going to be a time when he comes back and he is going to bring back to himself all who are his here, all who have chosen to surrender their lives to him and to yield our lives to him. He will come and he will bring us to be with him forever. Until that time happens, he sets us loose to be his light in this world. The light of the world, the salt of the earth, and the people who will bring him and bring his blessing. Merry Christmas to you in these dark days that are illumined by the light of Christ. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we celebrate you, the life, the light to our darkness, the wonderful counselor of truth and wisdom who guides our way, the mighty God who is strong to intervene in our lives, The everlasting Father who loves us with a tender love exactly as we need. The Prince of Peace who descends on us with peace in our hearts, even in the midst of all of this struggle. Oh Lord, we thank you for that and we worship you for that. If someone is here today who yet needs to embrace that from you, Oh, Lord, would you hear them as they would offer to you a prayer. I see who you are at Christmas, Jesus. I see who you came to be. I hear what you have done for me on the cross for my sin. And I hear that now you are in heaven praying. Lord, you gave yourself to me. I give myself to you. Would you receive me as yours? Shine the light of your love in my heart. Make me a new man. Make me a new woman from right inside the depths of my heart. Oh, do that today, even this Christmas time. I could live now for you and then await that day when I come to be with you forever. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us this morning. Again, Merry Christmas to you. If this has raised any questions or thoughts, or there anything that you would just like to ask about or talk about, I hope that you will uh, email me or contact me. And uh, I've sent out an email uh, invitation to uh, those of you who are members of our church. I hope you can join us for uh, a a Christmas coffee time uh, on Zoom after this is over. Check your email and look for the invitation. There is a link there for that. If you didn't get one and you would like to come, um, email me or contact me through this Facebook page, and I'll, I'll be happy to invite you as well. Merry Christmas. God bless you and keep you and love you so that you can walk in his love and his light. Amen.